Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first panel um, to look into the access deer problem, which is a growing problem of country, which is my district. And um, it's having such a negative impact on our community that I wanted to put this um, panel together so that we could look at some of the issues that are threatening the farmers and, and um, the ranchers of country, and as well as it's, when it is bothering residents. So last year, some of the farmers from the county's Kula Ag Park met with me. I think they also uh, met with the mayor and they, they spoke of their frustration um, with the growing access deer problem and when they spoke to me, they asked me if it would be problem, uh, if it would be possible for us to put up a fence at the Kula Ag Park. And there's two, there's existing, and then there's a new one um, that we acquired. And I have to say that this is probably the wrong time to be talking about putting up a fence at the Kula Ag Park because it's a pandemic and funds are tight. Um, but that was their request and, and they have implemented some programs to try to combat the growing access to your problem. And as you can assume, um, it does eat the crops and takes away revenue from them. So um, what really got me and made me think I better do something about this is that I, I got an email from a resident in Pukalani asking me to help them with the um, access deer that are now going into their yard. And I thought, okay, first, it, you know, farmers and I was hearing from ranchers, but now it's actually going into residential um, places. And then the following week, I saw a letter from Shirley Jones, who also lives in Pukalani, asking for assistance from the growing access deer problems. And her one statement she ended with me ended with really got to me. And she asked, "How can we how can we become self sustaining?" And so I thought this access deer problem is now affecting our residents. And so I I thought I would get together a panel of experts because that's who's here tonight. Um, and so that we can start talking about the growing access deer problem and hear from government entities that may have a opportunity to help us work together to solve this problem. Um, last month, my staff put out a press release just to announce that we're gonna do tonight's meeting. And we asked for people's comments beforehand so that we could gather it and then create um, the opportunity for the panel to speak about it. Um, there were like over 150 thoughtful and honest responses from hunters, farmers, ranchers, and even students. I mean, I was just impressed with the breadth of the community and um, who wanted to share with us what their concerns were. We received emails, um, phone calls. I'm still getting phone calls and emails today, as well as Facebook posts. So the social media um, went viral. The survey that we um, the comments that we took back, I just wanted to share that with you before we start. Um, and it said that what the number one priority for the over 150 people that, um, that sent in their comments was, probably not surprising, there were many hunters who wanted to hunt on private land. This is a, this is a, a graph that shows you. So the number one was the, um, with 28 comments were from, was that comment. And then the second um, highest was um, to lighten restrictions, regulations for processing and reselling. So we have Dr. Joshua Bell, uh, who may be able to talk about that or DLNR. And um, change maps zoning for hunting on state and county lands. And um, DLNR maybe could talk about that. Deer reduction programs and incentives um, was the fourth highest. And then another comment that I heard quite often was to donate food to organizations like um, Maui Food Bank, so help feed the homeless. So utilize the access deer meat and put it to productive use. Um, so that was basically a summary of what was talked about. Um, and important takeaways are that farmers need help and, and people want to know if there are effective birth control options and hunters would like to be able to hunt safely and responsibly. Um, so today's uh, the panel of speakers are mm -hmm. important. And I, I wanted to also mention that uh, we are, tonight we are, we are not accepting comments and that if anybody wanted to or has comments, you can send, my, send an email address 
to me at the office or you can call me um, so that we can answer you if you have a question that didn't get answered through this process. Tonight we have seven speakers and I know that they are um, they have some schedules to go to so I wanted to start on that. Um, the speakers would be speaking for about 10 minutes and um, each. The lineup of speakers tonight are Mayor Michael Victorino, who everyone knows has been working really hard in the pandemic. So thank you very much, Mr. Um, Mayor Victorino for making the time to be with us. Representative Linda Coit, she's a District 13 representative. And this access deer has become her issue uh, for the island of Molokai and she's included Maui um, and, and Lanai uh, with your emergency proclamation. So thank you for working hard on that. From the Department of Ag, I have Chairperson Phyllis Shimabukuro Geyser. And um, from DLNR, we have Hawaii Wildlife Manager John Medeiros with the Division of Forestry and Wildlife. He's an important person because everyone goes to him for permits or knows of your work. So thank you very much um, for being here, John. And then from the um, Wildlife Services, Wildlife Services, we have Hawaii State Director Darren Phelps, as well as Trevor Liu, and he's Assistant um, State Director. So congratulations, both of you, on your new positions, because you all basically have taken on more responsibilities. And um, the last speaker is Dr. Joshua Bell. He's a veterinarian. Oh, Lynn. Lynn. Yes. Oh. Um, first of all, then, I'd like to introduce our mayor, Mayor Michael Victorino. Mayor, are you there? As you may know, he's been working really hard on the coronavirus pandemic, and thank you for making the time to be here. Um, what, he has my agriculture in very big ways through this pandemic, and um, the, the ranchers, the farmers, and providing food for the Maui Food Bank and different things. But also, uh, maybe Mary, you can also educate us about your $1 million grant you made available recently through Housing and Human Concerns. But those are kind of an intro. I want to thank you for your support for agriculture and our livestock community and to help us with this access deer problem. Mayor, take it away. Mahalo and thank you, um, Council Member Sugimura for putting this on. I think it's a great opportunity for all of us to discuss a problem. And, you know, I have to add this, you know, you mentioned and thank you, Lynn, uh, for all what you've done, Representative Decoit, and uh, we've been keeping track. Uh, the governor has finally come forward and helped make that emergency proclamation. A lot of work you did uh, I was just on the sidelines, just rooting you on and trying to help you. But, you know, I know you did a lot of the legwork and I appreciate everything you've done. But, you know, it wasn't only for the people of Molokai. It is really for the people of my county. So mahalos for that. Um, the access deer overpopulation exists on all three islands and in immense amounts. Um, private landowners have been reluctant to let hunters go on property for many years because of different liability issues. So there's a part that maybe the state has to work along with the county to change some of the liability issues that would, you know, reduce the opportunity to mitigate and to uh, maybe contain, um, contain some of the herds. But the herds have now not only moved all over Molokai, all over Lanai, but all over Maui County. They're out and Wailuku Heights, where I live, we have deer. They're in Pukukui. They're in the West Maui Mountains. They've come across the the uh, what you call peninsula. They're looking for food. They go wherever food is available and they're attacking golf courses. They're attacking other crops over here. Bobby Pahia and that group says that they've seen deer around. They've been attacking their crops. It is all over this county. It is something that is really taking off and the deer population is continuously growing exponentially. That's one aspect. The other aspect is safety and well being. There are a number of accidents that have occurred on Molokai and some here in Maui County and Lanai where vehicles have run into animal, uh, deer and caused major accidents and also even minor, minor accidents. And it's really becoming a health and safety issue. On Molokai, you've had that major drought where deer were do just dropping dead, dropping dead in front yards and backyards and pastures in gullies all over. And we put monies with the Department of Public works to assist both landowners and the public in general in digging holes or digging 
um, areas so that we could put the carcasses in. And so I want to give recognition to my Department of Public Works and others who have been contributing on Molokai for the amount of deer that have been uh, dropping dead from the drought. On Lanai, we have the deer problem with some kind of disease, and they're still working on that. And so there's multiple issues, not only with overpopulation, but there's also challenges with the deer populations uh, having you know, different issues. And so that makes it very difficult to have one size fit all. But I think together we can find solutions. Um, we put $1 million earlier this year in the 2020-21 uh, budget. And that money is there for 300,000 for Lanai, Molokai and Maui itself to work on mitigating plans and programs that can uh, reduce deer herds and utilize that meat in other areas. We've also talked about throughout Maui County, the ability to utilize this meat for food production. You know, we helped our ranchers and farmers during this pandemic by buying food and buying meat from our local producers to help them during these trying times, whether it's Molokai, Lanai, or Maui, and as well as feeding those in need, especially the large population of unemployed throughout Maui and Maui County. And so with all of that being said, there's many programs that we have created and we are looking to even enhance with farming and ranching. And venison could be a big part of this. We have the herds, we have the ability. Now we need the ability to uh, have mobile units and or dedicated slaughterhouses where with a kill, we could take that uh, venison down process and have meat available, not only for the homeless, but the for people at large, people that live here, people could use that and eat that. And so this is long, along with the PPP, the wild cow and some, and the amount of pigs, the wild boars that are around and the wild uh, feral animals that we have. We have a lot of food we could utilize. It's just a matter of putting a plan together. So I'm proposing right now that with the state money and I, I, I put in another 200,000 with the state to work on this plan so that we can have plans for every island. I think that's important. We're all a little different. We're all not one size fits all. But how we can utilize, you know, I, I'm going to go over to Molokai Lane in the next week or two to meet with some of the guys about some of the programs they want to have on Molokai. So I'll let you know. And if you can be there, fine. You know, I know you're very busy with the legislative session, just like me with other sessions here. And pretty soon we're going to go into budget. But with all of this being said, um, I'm open to ideas. I want to make sure that, first of all, whatever we do, we develop appropriate measures to track the population trends. I think this is something we've never really done a good job in tracking where these herds are and how big they get in certain areas. I think this is important. We want to develop a access deer management program for sustainability purposes. We're not looking to eliminate them. We're looking to reduce the herd so that it doesn't impair our farmers, our, our, our residents, it doesn't endanger them as they drive around. We want less deer so that deer are still here and can be sustainable as a food product for many years to come. We want to protect our crops and foliage. Okay, like I said that earlier. We need a good partnership with the land, the large landowners, so that we can balance the excess deer population throughout Maui and Maui County. Yeah. Establishing partnerships that provide, what I mentioned earlier, a mobile slaughter facility for added, for value added uh, products and value added facilities throughout Molokai, Lanai and Maui. And finally, channel, um, channeling the access deer to become an incredible food source. I truly believe that is something we can do, should do and will do as time goes on. These are some of the most important points I would like to bring up tonight and give you that my commitment to do what we can to make sure that this all works out. In closing, I'll say this. I didn't want to take 10 minutes. I don't know how long I took, but I want to give everybody more time to discuss their, their ideas and their um, uh, uh, programs. But it's only a beginning. And I want to thank you again, Yuki, for putting this together. It's a beginning for all of us to better manage our feral animals, but starting with the access deer and moving into other areas because I believe the access deer is just one tip of the iceberg, which you know we have many others here. And if we can make them sustainable food um, sources, um, 
better yet for us, better yet for our people. Less we have to grow, less we have to bring in, and more importantly, a sustainable uh, product that we all can utilize for sustenance and as well as uh, containing a population that has really desecrated a lot of our, our farmers and as well as other fair, uh, foliage throughout this county. Mahalo for your time. And again, mahalo to Lynn and Yuki for all their work and everybody else out there, even you and the DLNR and, uh, and everything else, you guys, all of you. Thank you and mahalos from myself and the people of Maui County. So that's great, Mayor. So did I hear you say that you put in additional money for uh, management plans for each island or for? No, no. You have the $300,000 that we put in the million dollars for the management plan. Okay. And so the additional $200 was to utilize because of the, the problem we were having both on Lanai and Molokai. And, you know, we had to send in uh, additional resources to help with some of the problems there. Oh, okay. Okay. And then the Very state good. also put money in. Uh, I'll let Lynn talk about that, but I thank Lynn and the governor for putting some money in there and, and to assist us in that area. Yeah, thank you everybody for working together um, to find that you know emergency proclamation because that was being called by the um, the farmers and the ranchers. They were hoping that something of the, like that would happen. So I look forward to maybe um, Lynn or um, or Phyllis um, Simabuko Geyser from Department of Ag who can talk a little bit about the proclamation uh, when it's your time. But thank you very much, Mayor, for uh, making the time. And I know you have another appointment, so. Um, you would have to leave, but very good. I'll hang for a little while because I want to hear some of the other people, but I'll be leaving in about uh, 15 minutes. Yes. Okay. Mahalo to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Representative, State Representative Linda Coit. She's from Molokai. Um, she represents Lanai, Molokai, Haiku, and Paia too, Lynn. Um, and that um, this is this has been her I, you know her thing this access deer so I would love to hear what you have to share and maybe you can share with us if there's anything on the state legislature at the state legislature that we could help you support um, for this problem. We cannot hear you, Lynn. You gotta unmute yourself. There. So, of course, thank you, Yuki, um, you know, Council, Councilwoman uh, Sugimura for putting this on. You know, we've had a lot of a um, lot of calls, a lot of emails in regards to access deer. And, you know, it was never the focus to focus on one island. This was a countywide issue uh, going back um, many years ago as we saw the population increase. So, of course, you know, this is, this is a great start. Um, I'd like to just say, um, towards uh, Mayor Victorino Ditto. Uh, I, I don't wanna repeat everything that he said. I agree with everything that he has said. You've been very instrumental um, as your hands was full with COVID. Uh, I literally placed a call to you and you were right there to say, what do you need? Um, literally the funding came available. The funding um, of course, you know, needs to be approved and I hopefully vetted within talking to those of farmers and ranchers that have been impacted and management plans. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Mayor, uh, Councilman Sugimura. Uh, let's start off, um, in, in 2019, I introduced legislation to, at that time called House Bill 265, literally related to invasive species, appropriating funds within the help uh, at that time invasive species and access deer was listed as invasive species. Uh, we were hit with opposition. Um, funding was going to be put forward to help address these issues. Um, with that said and done, Bill dies. Um, you know, we, we're here two years later um, with those ranchers and farmers that saw what was coming. Um, and as we cannot turn back the time, clearly what we were dealing with several months ago was the health and safety issues of the people on Molokai, farmers and ranchers that were ravaged. Uh, pastures to dirt, management totally went out the door and we were not equipped, taking on herds in the thousands eating up and causing erosion, encroachments on pastures that were meant for carrying capacity, not to mention accidents, a um, hundred plus accidents and air vacs. Clearly we saw that the state had a problem, Molokai had a problem. Um, you know, you talk about capacity, 
If your capacity of area has no grass, you have no capacity. I reached out directly to um, John Madeiras, DOFA manager, and, and I, I resort to John a lot because John comes with the expertise, the know-how and the people and knowledge. Um, of course, he works under restrictions within also DLNR. John um, quickly made it a point to um, give input assessment. Um, you know, we work side by side. Clearly, um, many uh, about five years ago, the creation of GMAC, um, the Game Management Advisory Committee, which is really crucial, was created within the state so that each island would have a representative on management issues of, of in this case, we're gonna uh, pertain it to deer. And it was literally that representative would go out into the community and address those needs. A report would have been submitted back to this um, body at the legislature 20 years prior to the convening. In this case, every island did have a comment and um, a report to give. It was Moloka'i that wasn't ready. So I wanna um, send a shout out to Nelson Rapanat, who is now the GMAC rep, clearly working within the Department of Land and Natural Resources and the people, in this case, hunters, um, landowners, and everybody on the ground. Um, we literally bridged that gap to address those issues. It was crucial that this body heard the needs of those islands, in this case, Maui County. Uh, that report has been submitted back to DLNR. We, we await it at the legislature because it kept our hands tied on trying to put and address the needs and um, the funds that needed. Uh, I then reached out as we saw the problems on Molokai getting worse and the thousands um, deer literally dying on the side of the road, dying on people's porches. I then reached out to Governor Ige as well as Mayor Victorino, um, asked Kalani and brought him up to speed, Senator English, and told him what was happening on Molokai. Governor Ige immediately um, reached out to every department. Of course, we started off with the Department of Health, DOFA, again, John. I cannot thank John enough um, to literally reach out. Our problem, what we're dealing with really is the equipment that is needed to assess capacity and infrared unit B2, which would be highly needed for John to do clear assessment within DOFA and then to allow for those of big herds to be managed and then to be looked at um, taking the precautionary measures. Um, Governor quickly did um, some background on it. We did research. He then, on January 27, initiated the emergency proclamation, um, which allowed us to do certain things. It allowed us to um, hit provisions within the law to be suspended so that certain functions in regards to emergency could be addressed, digging of pits to do burial, grubbing areas to protect um, some of those areas. Um, within um, the need for those federal funds also to help um, glad, uh, happily Secretary of Ag Tom Vilsack, which I, I'm sure um, Phyllis can share with you folks later, um, was then appointed by the president. I believe this just happened yesterday. Uh, we awaited that because we also await the funds that will be needed to help assist many farmers and ranchers. Uh, I wanna thank Phyllis, the director from Department of Ag, as we had conversation on how could we help the small farmers and ranchers she had scrambled, and it's not much money, but it is about $200,000 to help assist you folks um, to bring back many of the um, needed, whether it be fencing, planting, so far it will be vetted from a process she has put that up on the website, and I'm sure she'll share that with you. Of course, this was first uh, directed to Molokai uh, because of the need of literally the major accidents, hundreds plus accidents within a one year span. Uh, we were air vacuuming people. And of course, um, Mayor, thank you for coming to Molokai. You know our challenges with the airlines also. Um, of course, the waiver will help, but of course, limited flights. Uh, we saw that it was a challenge as we air vacuuming people to Honolulu and trying to bring them back to Molokai. Again, health safety issues. Um, so of course, we knew that this was needed to be a county issue and had asked the governor to encompass Lanai and all of Maui because we saw what was happening in those areas. The bad part, when we introduced this bill, we actually prevented, what was prevented here was we had an employee from NIST that had opposed 
this bill that could have prevented a lot of the stuff that was going on. Senator English and I, um, at that time, we had issues with the emergency relief going forward. But at the same time, the proclamation was very uh, instrumental to help us overlook some of this stuff and then seek out also federal funds to help. Um, Mayor Victorino, again, thank you so much. Um, you know, the phone call was made, literally a find that money. My whole thing behind the money that is gonna be made available is that, and this is just my suggestion, as we've talked to farmers and ranchers abroad. Um, you know, I have conversations with several different ranchers. Uh, Bobby Ferrer, I had also brought it up as the manager with Kaupua Ranch. And I agree with a lot of what he and many ranchers have said, we need to engage somewhere within a trapping system I think um, the beautiful write-ups of grants um, and approvals within some of the nonprofits need to be looked at real clear. Um, suggestions within fencing in certain areas provide pens and alleyways so we don't just kill. We leave and we continue to feed and within that process, um, carcasses that can also be used for added within bone meal, not to just kill and dump, but to kill and feed, or maybe even the word kill is bad. Um, but we need to look at long-term sustainability efforts. It's one thing to write up something beautiful and so forth, but the execution has been poorly found. So my request within the approval of the so-called grants within all of those islands is to talk to the farmers and ranchers. They have resources themselves, but I think the minor tweaks and the ideas that they do have will truly sustain itself it will truly drive economic development within these areas. For myself, as the, as the state continues to provide hunting license and so forth, we need to also be part of allowing those that continue to be hunters to be given that uh, authority to come in and also hunt you. And areas that need management, leave that set aside so that most of those ranchers don't deal with the burdensome of having to deal with illegal, or as we would call um, hunters operating in an area and when you have the, the hunter or the ranch handler having to deal with trespassing or, or those with running passes, as we would like to call it, it's not a good situation. I've encouraged the Department of Land and Natural Resources, as well as DHHL also to open up their area so that people can continue to gather as resource food and supplements. Um, these are some of the alternatives with respect um, of our resources and food for the people of Hawaii. Management, I believe, is key to protect and to maintain. As many of our landowners have also been part of that conversation, and John has been instrumental in having that relationship. I, I don't like the fact that we come in and we try to reduce herds by helicopters. I think we can work this properly on the ground without just killing and just leaving things as a burial site. Um, and that's just some of the things I wanted to share with you folks. I appreciate the, the time to share this with you folks. And of course, uh, my office is always here. Um, I'll continue to work side by side with the mayor as well as councilman uh, Sugimura and the council, whatever you folks need. But I think the simple tweaks and making validation behind grant monies being awarded is key to making sure the issue is addressed. And again, I resort back to John Madaris and his expertise behind this. Um, but thank you again, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Mahalo. Uh, but then thank you very much for your passion. I got to say, man, you were on fire on this whole access deer issue. And I think um, that you work with the mayor's office, Stacey Crivello. Um, she's pretty knowledgeable also about this um, subject. So uh, well, look how I give them, huh? Good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And keep us posted with whatever um, help you may need and um, along the way, if the council can assist. But we will continue to work on this and I hope to bring you in because we're gonna, I know you have to leave to go to the Haiku Community Association yeah. meeting eventually. Sorry, yeah, yeah uh, talk about their issues. But um, I wanted to thank you and please do continue to um, include us. As we go along, I'm going to have another panel, and I'll, I'll let you know as we, you know, as we schedule that and in different, um, different. Mahalo, people. Yuki. Yeah, thank you. So, thank you. So, our next speaker is Phyllis Shimabukuro Geyser, and she is the chairperson for Hawaii Department of Agriculture. 
Um, she's a longtime advocate of agriculture and she really advocates for locally grown food. I, I read that on your, um, you know, your bio and I just think that's so true about you. Um, I must say that when I first met her, I was surprised for such a powerhouse. I told her this earlier that she is a really tiny person, but she's a wealth of information. I've been to a couple of her, um, her Department of Ag um, board meetings and um, you know, you've done a great job. So I wanted to invite you and maybe you can talk a little bit about the emergency proclamation and some of the things that um, Lynn has shared. So thank you, um, Chair Shimabukuro uh, Geyser. Uh, thank you very much, Council Member Yukimura Sugimura. Um, Mayor, uh, Representative Decoy, uh, other uh, distinguished speakers. Um, you know, I must say that uh, I have family roots. Um, my father was born in Peahi. So, um, you know, um, I, I feel for the county of Maui um, because, you know, it's part of my family story. And um, we have roots um, in agriculture in Maui uh, before relocating to Oahu uh, during the Second World War. Um, I'd like to say that uh, much mahalo to Representative Decoy. Uh, she does have um, the best interests of the um, public health and safety of the people of the county that she represents. Uh, she reached out to Governor Ige and Governor Ige uh, reached out to our department asking us, you know, what can we do for the farmers? Um, he had seen a video of um, the devastation uh, due to uh, the deer overpopulation um, and its uh, uh, correlation to the drought situation. So um, what we did was, um, because governor uh, issued that emergency proclamation, um, you know, the health, safety, and welfare of the people of Maui County, um, he did identify, um, you know, the causes from also the deer, access deer overpopulation and its impacts on uh, the agriculture uh, community. So um, because we were given uh, that declaration, uh, it gave us flexibility with our procurement code and our requirements. And um, that was the reason why we were able to um, start some kind of process to give relief to the farmers. Uh, we are using our barrel tax funds. Um, many of you who are familiar with uh, the Department of Agriculture, you know, we have a small budget, um, but uh, we always try to support our stakeholders uh, with whatever we have. And so we've identified uh, $200,000 um, to offer. Uh, we, we did a news release um, and we are re uh, requesting for farmers, ranchers uh, to apply. Um, the deadline is uh, March 8th. And the reason why we did that is because uh, we're hoping our goal is to start issuing um, the relief funds um, possibly as early as the beginning of April. Um, but, you know, we wanted to be able to give some kind of cash relief um, quickly. Um, you know, we were, we were also reaching out uh, the middle of January uh, because of the information we're receiving from Representative Decoy and uh, Senator Kalani English, uh, we reached out to USDA, and um, one of the uh, two of the agencies that we reached out to was NRCS um, because you know they do have a, a program that that assists with exclusion fencing. So uh, we reached out to them, uh, referred. Uh, their uh, state conservationists to uh, the offices of Representative Decoy and Senator English. Uh, we also reached out to USDA Farm Service Agency um, to inquire uh, if they had existing programs that could assist our farmers. Um, and they are awaiting uh, 
Secretary uh, Vilsack was just confirmed uh, yesterday. So, you know, they're waiting for him to declare Maui a drought disaster area. Um, so with that, uh, the ranchers would and farmers would be able to apply for assistance for uh, to supplement their feed. And I think um, that is very important because we have gotten um, information uh, that you know uh, ranchers have to make the tough decision during this situation, um, and you know uh, cattle are uh, succumbing to star starvation, uh, not only the deer. Um, so I have an opportunity to listen to Secretary Vilsack early tomorrow morning. Uh, and if I am able to, um, I will try and, you know, ask him uh, to please, uh, you know, declare that declaration for uh, Maui due to drought. Um, and so uh, some of the questions I think that we have been receiving, uh, we have received um, applications already in the short time that we posted. Uh, last week, Friday. And so, you know, this um, relief program that we're offering, um, uh, each award uh, can be um, up to a maximum of $10,000. And it would uh, include costs that the farmer rancher incurs uh, since July 1st of 2020. So um, it's not only currently, but if the rancher or the farmer can um, provide proof um, of loss to their production or their herd um, from July 1st of 2020, um, those costs are eligible um, to be considered for this relief. Um, in, in any protective or mitigating measures um, to purchase a fee, um, to purchase seed, to you know, replant, any replanting efforts, um, replacement of their livestock, uh, fencing, fuel, labor costs, uh, and rental equipment, anything that they can um, justify uh, to restore their, their farm, their production uh, to functioning, a functioning status uh, pre uh, July 1st, 2020. Um, so there are we have a form. Um, it's available online, um, and if uh, those that uh, are in need, uh, please submit that to us um, by noon of March eighth. So I'm available to um, answer any other questions, um, and uh, we'll com continue to also monitor to see what other federal resources are available for our farmers. Um, being a, from a farming family and, you know, being in farming for over 30 years myself, you know, I, I, can, I can really truly connect with um, what farmers do, uh, what they have to deal with in all types of disaster, whether it's economic, uh, marketing related, uh, natural you know, invasive species, uh, you know, I, I have experienced that and I would like to say that we're going to try everything we can uh, to assist our stakeholders um, with other what resources we have available. So thank you very much. Uh, um, I'm muted. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So it's, it's um, encouraging that you're going to be meeting with the new secretary uh, of ag. And are you saying then that possibly he may declare Maui County um, a drought area or just Maui or Molokai? Uh, I think uh, it's the intention is to have the county declared. County. Okay. Yeah. Um, so he's going to be um, speaking be, uh, towards a national association of state ag directors. And um, if there is an opportunity uh, to ask, uh, ask questions. Um, at that time, if I can get in line and, and get some time, uh, I will ask him to please um, 
make it a priority to to declare Maui County um, as a uh, for drought disaster, and then that should free up additional resources um, through the uh, USDA, and I think that 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 it supplements everything else that the county is doing and you know what the Department of Agriculture is doing. Oh, that's great. I have to tell you that I um, have gotten a lot of requests for fencing. So if you put that it's in the very expensive. It's very expensive. And I know the $10,000 is, you know, is not adequate. But um, anyway, you know, we just want to help as much as we can. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, so one of the questions that I got, um, and if you could just, you know, talk briefly about it is um, some of the concerns were could they use the grant money for traps and ammunition? So there were two questions that came from the um, public. I think when um, they, uh, you know, we did um, describe um, eligible expenses um, uh, in protective and mitigating measures, um, that's broad. Uh, when they apply um, to provide a strong justification on how that uh, will restore their ability to um, become productive and functioning again uh, for their their farming operations. So, like you know, pro provi provide as much information and justification as you can to help you know to demonstrate that you need these things to be um, uh, eligible so you can recover and become um, productive with you know whether you're, you're ranching or whether you know, you're know you in crop production. Okay, and do you think that the emergency proclamation which ends on March 28th would be um, extended? Oh, right now um, for us, um, I think that's it. Uh, what we can uh, uh, fund for this fiscal year. Um, and as everybody is aware, the state is facing extreme um, financial difficulty. Um, so we're uncertain about our budget, um, what, you know, what we will get for the next fiscal year. But, um, you know, I must say that we're very grateful that uh, we, the department does have special funds um, from uh, barrel tax, and then also for the cargo uh, fee that, you know, we assess for invasive species. And so, you know, those special funds have um, been very valuable for us as a department, uh, state department to assist agriculture and the industry. So hopefully, uh, you know, we, we will be able to uh, provide more assistance in the next fiscal year, but we just have to wait and see what's passed in the budget. Okay. And anybody who wants to know the link to the grant, uh, we can share it later. So thank you very much. Sure. So the next speaker is Dr. Um, not Dr. Um, John Medeiros. Um, so um, John is with DLNR, and everybody wants to talk about permitting. And um, he is the wildlife Maui wildlife manager, and uh, he's a division of forestry with um, DLNR. So um, John Medeiros, I know that you're on and I just want to say that the, the number one um, question from the community was um, would the state consider hunting a hunting program on Maui similar to Lanai which is a question maybe you can um, announce or explain what Lanai does with Pulama Lanai and then uh, which is hunting on private land so can you um, talk about that I think that was one of the that was the top um, question I wanted Okay, um, DLNR, uh, DLNR DOFA, which is the Department of Forestry and Wildlife, or Division of Forestry and Wildlife, um, we have a lot of partnerships and we work with uh, private landowners and um, we're always willing to look at opportunities for hunting and, um, and coming into, into a agreement with the landowners. Um, and one of the areas that we have done that and we've been very successful is a, co a cooperative game management area that we have on Lanai. Um, we manage the hunts there with cooperation with the landowner. Um, we, we, um, we do surveys 
um, aerial surveys, determine the population uh, trend on the island. Um, my staff will, will put together uh, what is needed to be harvested in the area. Uh, we'll run a hunt, a lottery system, and um, that way we're managing the population um, on Lanai. In the, in the event that the population gets too high, we present it back to the company saying, oh, we need to take X amount of more animals in the area. We need to either increase the weeks uh, or the weekends for the hunts. Um, we may say that the, the sex ratio is high. There's more, there's more does versus bucks that we need to eliminate the does. So we'll manage a hunt based on that. We'll try to knock down the numbers of does. And that way we're managing the population so that we don't run into these kind of problems that is happening on Molokai and, and on Maui. On Molokai and Maui, we don't manage those populations like it was happening on Molokai Ranch. Um, on Maui, um, there is no big, the, the biggest population of deer are in private lands. Um, we continue to meet with the private land owners. We're willing to meet with the private land owners. If they want to come into agreement with us and, and talk stories and work to have hunting in the area, great, we're willing to do that. A lot of the issues in which the mayor is correct, liability always comes as a as an issue. Um, Landowners are scared of people going in there, shooting, shooting their cattle or cutting their fence or shooting somebody. So liability does play a big issue. Um, and it, if we can get in there, we can help if we can manage the area, it's going to be a, a better asset for them. Um, one other area, just to let you know, that uh, Kanaulu Ranch, adjacent to our um, uh, Kula Forest Reserve, is also a, a cooperative game management area that we, we lease out a thousand acres. So it can be done. Uh, it's just a willingness of sitting down with the la landowners, and we're always willing to do that um, and sit down. Um, there's a lot of tools that Dylan R can offer as the ways to control the animals. Um, we have ideas on how to manage the populations. We have ideas, uh, we have control permits that we can issue, wildlife control permits. Um, we have um, another permit, it's called the game harvest permit, where if individuals want to harvest the animals, going through USDA and through our permit process, they can process the deer for meat consumption. So. Um, we're here for to assist and to consult. Um, and the other thing that I agree also with the mayor, there is a plan. Uh, there's an access deer management plan. It needs to be implemented and we need to sit down with the players, um, the county, state, federal, and big ranch private land owners to sit down and see how we, what we can do and manage this populations, um, getting into management zones where deer is acceptable, where deer is not acceptable. I mean, this is the things that we need to address. Um, I see deer moving in areas. Uh, permits go up when drought conditions go. Uh, when we're in drought conditions. People are screaming at me for permits, to, you know, to to shoot at night. Uh, we know that happens, and then it subsides you know, once we get rain because the deer are dispersed, um, and they know where to go. Wherever the feed is at, the the resources they're going to go for it. So, I mean, we're here to help in any way we can. And that's just my spiel. And I, I just wanted to say that, that, um, and we can move forward. I've worked with uh, Representative Lindy Coit, uh, Molokai, um, very great cooperation with the county and state moving forward. Um, we talked about sick animals, calling, calling the population, what tools they can use, what they can do in their areas and how they can do it. And moving forward, I think we're, we're making an attempt. There's a plan coming out for Molokai um, and the hunters are willing uh, to make an uh, impact on, on the population. But going back to what I'm saying, when you don't have a population managed, that's when you have these problems. And, and that's what's happening even on Maui. I mean, I've seen deer now by the airport. I mean, uh, once, once um, Kane stopped, and Mahi Pono now has problems because deer is moving all over and it's not only deer, it's deer and pig and they're all moving. You know, and, and you don't blame them when the conditions are bad, they're gonna look for the, the food source and, and that's what's happening. That's my spiel. <laughs> Any questions? 
So actually, you know, you're like number one, um, how do we get hunters on private land? That is with the rent, with the, with the landowner, sitting down with the landowners, okay. which, which we, we've tried in the past. Um, I think oh, we, we tried to where we, we lease out uh, parcels, like for Lanai, we lease um, our, our C, CGMA is 3,000 uh, 3, acres that we lease from uh, Pulama Lanai. And um, we have a good agreement with them and, and we continue uh, working with them. And it's it's been over 40 plus years that we still continue working with them in managing the deer population on Lanai. So, so wanna... it, excuse me. So no, if people so, hunt on, on state land, mm -hmm. how do they do that? They can, they can hunt on state lands if, if it's a hunting area, as long as you have a hunting license and you're hunting between a, a sun, sunrise to sunset and following the rules. Um, in our areas, it, it's open for, uh, for deer. Um, if, and you're going to counter is, is kind of rare because you're not going to see it like how you see it on the ranches. Uh, you may encounter some deer in, in, in our areas, like up in the Kula Forest Reserve. Um, but majority, like I said, the population is on private land. So, I mean, as long as, and, and even on the private land, if you're gonna hunt, you need, you need to have a valid current Hawaii hunting license in order to do that. Okay, so, so if somebody doesn't have a hunting license now, since that was the number one um, request, um, how do they get a hunting license? You, you go to uh, take the hunter ed class and get a certificate for hunter ed. And, and then from there, you can purchase a hunting license uh, through our um, website uh, and, and you get a hunting license. And, and it's not only good in um, Hawaii, other states have the hunter ed class that you can take and um, it, it, it will um, be valid through our, our system that you can be able to still get a hunting license because we have people from the uh, mainland that also come and hunt and purchase hunting license. And how much is it? What Twenty dollars. It it's real expensive. Twenty dollars. <laughs> Twenty dollars. Yeah, yeah. Linda Coy, you should increase that fee. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not that easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that. Easy. Okay, so it's online. So in COVID, people can still um, get their yes. License. Yeah. Right now, um, we were offering classes, um, uh, um, hunter ed classes, but due to COVID. They were on the process of making a online uh, classes for people to take, but you can take them. I think Colorado offers online classes and, and that will substitute. As long as you get the certificate, you can purchase it. You can still purchase a um, hunting license through the state of Hawaii. Okay. And um, another big concern where people wanted to have the hunting, uh, the maps updated, is that, is that through DLNR? Our maps are updated, and and you can oh. go to our you can go to our deal on our website. Okay. Um, I might have it handy somewhere. Uh, you can go uh, dlnr.hawaii.gov backslash dofa, and then you can click into the hunting areas, and it shows all the hunting areas for each island. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then um. um would this be you? It says create deer restriction incentives. Does that come from DLNR? Uh, deer, I'm not sure what they're talking about. Oh. That. Okay. Uh, if, if they're looking at what processing deer, that would have to go through the Department of the USDA. Okay. And, and, their, um, and um, what their requirements are. But if you're doing control work or you're doing doing a game harvest permit and those activities are done at night you need a a control uh, a permit from us okay. and we'll issue a permit that way um and another question came up is people wondered how how much access deer are there on each island oh my god <laughs> i can't answer that um we really don't know i mean everybody's been throwing I mean, I've gotten, when we're on Molokai, guys, people were throwing out numbers, 30, 40, 50,000 deer. And I I don't know, because we don't survey the whole islands. Um, and I wouldn't, even on Maui, we don't survey the whole island. So it's, 
it's real hard to determine what the population is. Wow, that's more deer than people on Molokai. <laughs> okay. So somehow, is that important for us to know how much deer there there is on each island? Or do when you, you start that? when you start seeing deer moving out into areas where they shouldn't be, that's when you start knowing you're having a problem. And and when when um, I've been on um, aerial flights and um, we've seen big herds. When when you see herds of uh, 500 plus, that that is a concern. You know, all bunched up together. Um, but also like, you know, when you have that disbursement and you're having animals coming into areas of concern, that's when we need to address the problem. And the, the later you, you address it, the worse off it's going to be. Yeah. So, I mean, um, and as, as we seen from what happened on Molokai, the conditions were so poor that the animals are not dumb. They're not going to stay on a ranch where there's no food. They're going to go into residential areas. They're going to go into condos. And when you have people that are also putting out water to help them out, feeling sorry for them, you're, you're, you're not solving the problem. You're just making the problem worse and creating more of a problem, uh, you know, because they're coming into there and destroying everything around the condos. So, yeah, it, when you see that, you're already in, in a bad situation already. Yeah. That's, that's how you gauge how bad it is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's that's probably right. Um, the, there's deer in my yard. I have no, only thing I have is landscaping and not even nice anymore because a deer had <laughs> eaten it. Um, so um, yeah, the problem is, um, and I didn't realize the mayor said that in Waluku Heights where he lives, there's deer. I didn't realize they're in Waluku Heights. Oh, we, we, we've seen deer in Lahaina, you know, they, they, they've been all over the island. Oh, okay. Um, and then you might know this. So one of the other concerns is no helicopter hunting. Do people yes. go? You can't do that, right? No, only only uh, federal and state government agencies can do um, aerial shooting, okay. and um, we won't do that on private lands. Um, it's it. There's so many different other tools to use. Hunting is a big tool. Um, herding herding animals into a corral is a, a, is a tool. Um, we have a permit process where um, you could use a helicopter. The private landowner can use a helicopter. It's called Manage Wildlife by Aircraft. And they can get a permit for that where they can herd the animal into a corral or into a pen. And then whatever they want to do with it, that's fine. As long as it's in a humane way. But there's a permit pro pro process for that. But um, no, not aerial. OK. And it's, it's very, um, it's a hot topic when we discuss aerial because a lot of people don't want to do aerial. Um, and um, another thing people have talked about is hunting to feed those in need. So mm -hmm. donations to Maui Food Bank or, or organizations like that. So mm -hmm. what is your position on it from DLNR? Oh, that's fine. Uh, we're, we're perfectly fine with that. Um, Matter of fact, um, Kalpo Ranch has is does that. Um, they go through the process with uh, USDA. Um, it all goes back to USDA and, and an inspection of the, the carcass and making sure what what kills proper and and the meat, um, the condition of the meat. Um, we just issue the permit for them to do if they're going to do what is called a selective harvest, then and it's going to be at night, a night operation, they need a permit through us. Night and, operation. Yeah. You remember now, hunting is only half an hour before sunrise to half an hour after sunset. That's the law. Anything okay. after that, you're, you're, you're night hunting and that's illegal. So either you have a permit to do what you control or it's illegal. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like, um, a lot of things center around you because is um, people want to go out there and hunt. So yeah, do you have a limit the yeah. number of permits you issue. Uh, which one? Control permits. Wildlife. Okay. Uh, a wildlife control permit. Let me explain a little bit on a wild. A wildlife control permit is if a private landowner and has um, as agriculture and over over two plus acres and they are having deer problems, 
they can request for a wildlife control permit. And a wildlife control permit allows them to, it's not selective, it's a control. So we're telling you, okay, you have deer problems. We'll send out, I'll send out my, one of my staff members to do an inspection to see what kind of damage you have. It can be fence line damage, crop damage, um, um, whatever. And then we'll issue, uh, they'll do an inspection, determine the damages, and then we'll issue a permit to that individual, or he may have a few shooters that, that he wants to be on the permit and they go out and they can go out at night with the permit has to be on hand. The people have to be on, they have to sign the permit. They have to be on the permit and carry the permit with them. They have to notify the police department, notify our don't care office that they're going out at that night. They have to abide by the conditions which in the conditions may have shooting direction, may have uh, the type of ammo they can use uh, or weapon they can use. Um, and they're going out there to control. We are not giving permits for someone to go out to shoot a buck because they want to shoot a buck at night. No, we want them to control every buck, doe, fawn, whatever's eating their vegetation or damaging their property. That's what the purpose of the permit is for. So yes, we do issue. Um, roughly, I think uh, Maui Nui in general, I think I've issued, I want to say we're probably about 50 something permits we've issued. Okay. Um, do you have a reservation system for hunting though? So can people make reservations? Um, there is one going on right, uh, right now that um, um, our, my game biologist Shane DeMontos is running it. It's a um, lottery for um, Lanai hunting. Oh. It's on. It's online. Online right now. Um, I don't have all the information with me right now, but um, we're looking at the access deer and mouflon season um, coming up. Of course, we're dealing with COVID, so we're working with the, the landowner on uh, conditions uh, restrictions. We don't want to send all too many hunters to Lanai at one crack, so we're trying to work with them, um, limit, limiting the number of hunters. Um, but there is a system going right now. Um, people can apply for an application and it's a lottery and then they'll get drawn for the hunt. So we mm -hmm. have that implemented on Lanai. We don't have anything like that on Maui. Uh, we have our hunting areas. You can go in our hunting areas. As long, like I said, as long as you have a hunting, hunting license, depending what hunting area you're going and what time of season. So you need to look at what our, our rules and regs what season it is, like on bird seasons, you're not gonna be going in a bird area to go hunt deer because there's certain uh, uh, weapons that you gotta, you can only use during bird season, vice, vice versa to, uh, to mammals. So make sure you, people look at the rules and regs pertaining to the area that they're hunting in. And there's- think, So John, do you think Maui needs a, uh, or Molokai needs a reservation system that Lanai has or-, or um, reservation, uh, I would say it would be nice if we can get uh, private landowners to work with um, going back to the liability and getting private landowners to, to get into um, partnerships um, and using hunting as a tool and maybe having, uh, it, it, there's ways of doing it by sitting, sitting down with the landowner the landowner might say, okay, I want X amount of people on my property. How can we do this? How can you help us? Let's, let's do a lease agreement. Or how about I give you this area and you run a lottery? I mean, we, we have to sit down and talk stories with the landowner. That's the first thing. And what the landowner gives us the opportunity to do and sit down and say, yes, I have a problem. How can you guys help me? And let's work out something, you know, because our tool is to hunting. We want to promote hunting public op opportunity for the public to hunt as, as that. And then thereafter we can, you know, if the numbers are not getting down, there's other tools we can use, control permits and stuff like that and working with the landowner. Okay. So there's there's a lot of opportunity. Okay. So John, my, my staff is telling me I'm keeping you on too long. So sorry oh, about okay. that. It seems like <laughs> all these, this graph, a lot of them is huge. So I just wanted to ask you <laughs> questions in the chat. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, okay. any, thank you very much, John. Um, so our next speaker um, is Hawaii State Director of Wildlife Services, uh, which is Baron Phillips and um, Trevor Liu, which is the deputy.
So Darren, you want to share what you do and educate us how we can utilize your services. Sure. Thank you, everyone. Um, we're, we're happy to be on this. And so, uh, yes, my name is Darren Phelps. I'm the state director Phelps. for wildlife services. Um, we are a small branch under APHIS, which is wildlife services. Um, so we get confused for a lot of things. And uh, we're a very unique wildlife agency. Um, we're largely a um, fee-based type of agency where we have to charge for services. Um, we get very little federal funding um, every fiscal year. Uh, the bulk of our funding um, comes from entering into agreements or projects with uh, other federal agencies, state, local, um, communities, um, private and public entities. And so I'd say if I don't have an exact figure, but just to give an idea, you know, I'd say 70 to 80% of our budget comes from agreements in dealing with wildlife. Um, the, the main thing or subject area that our agency addresses is human wildlife conflicts. Um, and this is right down that alley um, where there is a need for a resource to be addressed. And we're, we're very fortunate in that um, we have the means to address in, in a couple of different ways. Um, obviously the first is through direct control where we can actually apply the control work. Um, the other aspect is what we call um, technical assist where we can assist people um, with deciding how they need to manage something, how they want to manage something and the resources that might be available to them. Um, we might be able to help with developing a plan, um, finding technology that would work for them. Um, and so there, there, there's a really wide range of services that we could provide. Um, just in this example, I can think of, you know, the human, uh, human health and safety aspect. There's uh, crop protection to consider. Um, there's always also a disease component. Um, you know, we do disease monitoring for um, various wildlife species throughout the state. And uh, we also have a, a research center that we work with, um, the National Wildlife Research Center. They are the um, research band of wildlife services. So if there is, um, research that needs to be done on a particular uh, species or wildlife issue, um, they'd be able to come in and set up and design um, a study to, to measure cost effectiveness of a tool on a certain species. Um, some of the things that, you know, I'd like to clear up, um, some things that are agency um, is not, or are not, I should say. Um, the, I wouldn't say the majority, uh, a good number of our employees um, were hunters ourselves. And, and so one thing we quickly like to dispel, uh, one myth is that we're, we're not here to um, come in and take over anything. Uh, we're actually, our agency is what is called non-regulatory. We have no law enforcement capability. We have no land management authority. And, and so um, we're really coming in from an aspect that trying to provide a service that someone may not have or expertise or access to. Um, so working alongside agencies such as DOFA and US Fish and Wildlife Services, whether it's the local community um, and that's where we feel the, the base of this all is, is that comes down to what type of resources and what, what does the communities or, or, or the local um, aspect consider, you know, 
important to them and taking those aspects into consideration and trying to make that work for everybody. And so it's, there's not always an easy solution. Sometimes there's conflicting goals, but I think at this point, um, it, it sounds like there's um, a strong sentiment for um, some type of public hunting system. Uh, we're, we're not the experts at that, but that's something, you know, from wildlife services standpoint, we would uh, fully support and like to help with if there is an aspect of that. Other than that, you know, we'd be able to work with various entities, landowners, whoever would need our help to address human wildlife conflicts. Um, so with that, I don't want to take up too much time. Um, I'd like to uh, pass it on to uh, back to Trevor or whoever else is next. So thank you very much. So Darren, I have to apologize because I called you Phillips. It's Phelps. My staff told me it's like Michael Phelps. <laughs> it's happened all my life. So thank you. <laughs> That's a famous name. So um, Trevor, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, Yuki, yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you again for, for inviting us to, to the meeting. And I just, I'll just touch on a couple of things. Again, I don't want to take too much time and I don't want to repeat what has already been said, but I did kind of want to pick up on what Mayor Victorino had said at the top there where uh, the one size doesn't fit all. And, and I think that's where we have the expertise to be able to adjust and to be able to provide everything ranging from, like Darren said, technical expertise all the way down to direct control techniques and, and methods. And, and it depends, you know, it, it depends on what kind of problems there are. And, and, and we've been within one geographical location of country Maui, for example. Uh, one control method may not be valid or effective from one farm to the next, even though they may be sitting right next to each other. So I think that's where we can help. That's another area where we can help is that we can kind of come up with these solutions based on uh, what the circumstances are. And, you know, again, picking up on what Darren said and, and, and also what John said, and that because we're not regulatory, and, and in fact, we, one of those 50 some odd permits, wildlife control permits that John mentioned issuing is issued to us. As even as a federal entity, we are required to abide by those same regulations that are put forth by the state. And in fact, oftentimes, because we're a federal entity now <laughs> trying to abide by these state regulations, we get uh, a little extra layer of scrutiny, uh, which, which is fine. Um, but, but again, the point being that, that we're not regulatory and, and we have to abide by the same rules as everyone else. Um, so, you know, Again, I think in your invitation letter, Yuki, you, you, you mentioned the four different areas you wanted to focus in on. And I think population control is, is the area that I think wildlife services, USDA wildlife services can help the most. And again, it, it, that, that assistance can range anywhere from, from technical assistance all the way on up to direct control. Um, you know, that, that is our, our main focus, which is wildlife damage management. Like, again, kind of riding on the tails of John and, and his comments, when, when we are asked to do a service or provide a service, which is to reduce the damage that is occurring to whatever resource, whether it's cattle or, or the feed that the cattle are, 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 are eating or the crop that the farmer is producing, we are not there to hunt. We are not there to take the trophy animal. We are there to reduce the damage. If, if it means taking all of the different age classes within a population, that's what we're there for. Um, however, that said, we are also not there to, you know, most cases, eradicate every single animal. Uh, and this kind of goes back to what um, 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 Ms. Decoit was mentioning is that that's, that's not, if, if that's what people are asking of us, in most cases, we would probably advise against it because it's just not realistic in most cases. And, and you know, it just happens to be not very popular either. 
Um, but anyway, you know, the, the idea and, and, and Mary Victorino is on point in that he's, he's said that this is about controlling the population. And again, to the point where these issues that we're having, human health and safety, crop depredation, um, competition for feed, disease are all managed uh, to the point where they get reduced and, and or largely eliminated. So without getting into too many more specifics and, and, and I know time is, is short, so I, I'll, I'll end with that. And, and again, we very much appreciate being part of the conversation and, and part of the solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I met with you um, both and um, I'm on the Kula Ag Park Committee and I mentioned to um, the president that possibly, you know, that you might wanna come in and help them. So if they're interested, I'll, I'll put you in touch with the Office of Economic Development under the County of Maui and, and the powers to be to possibly arrange for that. So thank you very much. Um, and the last speaker, um, Dr. Bell, Joshua Bell, um, he is a veterinarian, uh, a medical officer with the USDA for Food Safety Inspection Services. And um, I have to tell you that a lot of the comments we got were people want to eat the, eat the deer, right? So they would need to follow your guidelines. And I wonder if you could help us through that process just to educate the community. Uh, what does that mean? Sure. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me to this, uh, this town hall meeting. Um, I'm excited to do this. Uh, I really wanted to, to introduce myself because um, for anybody who's actually seeking USDA inspection, um, I'm the person they're going to have to, to basically contact to help work um, towards that goal. Um, so it, I'm not a very easy person to find either. So I, I was glad when I saw that you were organizing this meeting and you put out those comments so that I could have to bring them and share with your office so that if anybody reaches out to you, that you can point them in my direction. Okay, great. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so basically what I wanted to touch on here is when it comes to meat inspection, uh, especially when it comes to the livestock, the, the animals that we really focus on in regard to the Federal Meat Inspection Act are going to be the cattle, the swine, uh, goats, and lambs. Those animals, they require USDA inspection if you're going to uh, try to do any sort of selling. Anything basically outside of personal use consumption will require inspection at slaughter. Um, those are our, what we call, we call them our amenable species. Now, when it comes to our non-amenable species, which is basically everything outside of uh, that and poultry, which would include bison and in this case deer, then we don't actually have the jurisdiction over that in terms of they're not required to be inspected by FSIS. However, if the state requires it or if somebody is harvesting it within a state and trying to ship out of state, uh, many times those states are going to say that, yeah, that, that product absolutely needs to be USDA inspected. So when it comes down to in, enforcement of those regulations, USDA is not gonna come in and, and tell you, you can't do that, that's gonna fall to the state. We'll, we try and keep our hands out of that, but if you are seeking USDA inspection, we're absolutely here to help. Um, so currently, I believe we are, and uh, we are assisting four different parties with USDA inspection within Maui County. Um, and we're more than happy to expand that number. So if anybody wants to seek that goal, you know, it, it actually, if we can get many people on board, then we'll increase our inspectors that we have in the islands. We can, you know, it's a job opportunity um, for inspectors to be there. Um, so some of the things that I, I do want to clear up, though, I do feel many phone calls from interested people that um, have found my information and, and are seeking that. Um, one of the questions they want, or basically what they would like me to do is come and see a deer that they have recently shot and just dragged out of the field, look at it and say, that, okay, it's good to go. Um, unfortunately, if we're going to be going the USDA route of inspection, we have to be involved in all aspects of that hunt, which includes... Um, going on the hunts with the, with the hunting party, making sure that the animals are harvested cleanly. So uh, I know Representative Decoy said, she doesn't like to use the word kill. So we use the word harvest, um, but make sure they're harvested humanely, which means for our regulations, one shot, one, you know, they're rendered unconscious immediately after one shot. Um, after that, the deer have to be brought to a facility, which is a clean and closed facility, which meets certain construction requirements, sanitation requirements, um, they'll be processed in front of one of either myself or an inspector that we have on the island. Um, at, and we're going to be monitoring the sanitary dressing to make sure that uh, they're following guidelines that we have established to make sure their knives are clean, make sure their aprons are clean, uh, pest control management. Uh, and like I said, too, the construction of the building is where I think a lot of people get held up. 
Um, so what was, I, I know it was brought up before, I've seen it in some of the comments, but things like a mobile slaughter unit, those units are absolutely outstanding for these types of, of hunts. So you can move them from site to site. They're already constructed to meet federal guidelines and regulations. They're easy to be cleaned. Um, we can control any sort of uh, fly pass, it flies from getting into the unit itself. Uh, the only drawback with those is they are expensive. I believe somebody was pricing out, they told me it was $350,000, $400,000 to try and get one out to the islands recently. Um, but it is possible we do have, what, four, I think we have four or five mobile units in the islands already that are currently operating, both with the, the deer and with other livestock species as well. So that is a possibility. And um, if you do that, I mean, like I said, it's a great way. And um, I did share uh, the, kind of the mobile slaughter unit guidelines with you, council member. And if anybody's interested, if you still have that, feel free to share anything that I've, I've given to you. Um, the, uh, so the other thing that will really prevent our services is that we are going to make sure that they are doing this legally. So if they do not have the deal on our permits, we're not going to be involved in the hunt. I'm just quite frankly, but we won't be involved in the illegal harvest of the game afterwards. Um, so if, if they have the proper permits, um, we do keep a copy of that in our office and our files to make sure that they're current. Um, and if they don't have that, then we just won't um, provide the services at that point. Once they have that, if they have a site selected, what uh, our requirements are, we'll go do a site survey, make sure that it's safe for our inspectors. So for our side, our safety is number one. Um, make sure, you know, everything that comes out, out of the field, all the deer that's processed, um, if we can't do it in a safe manner, then we just, we are unable to provide the service as well. Um, and at any point, if the inspector feels that they are in an unsafe position, then they can remove themselves, uh, which is built into our federal regulations. Um, aside from that, uh, the other holdup that a lot of people have is that we, for our amenable livestock species that I mentioned before, those big four, that's a free service that we're going to provide for a federally infected establishment. For voluntary species, which would be these non-amenable species, um, they, we do consider them voluntary. Um, and because they're not required by the USDA to be inspected, we do charge, which is a big hold up because it's not a it's not a very cheap um, fee that we have. So just if we are able to work it into an inspector's normal hours, it's sixty six dollars an hour currently. If it's in an overtime situation, we're talking eighty one dollars an hour that the USDA charges for these hunts. So it's a very cost limiting um, factor for a lot of people. Which once they see that, that's when I see a lot of people just say they they can't afford it. So really, if they're doing the USDA side and they're looking to do commercial sales, get in the wholesale, start doing interstate shipments um, and make it a business, that's really where they can thrive with that. Um, but short of a congressional change on those fee schedules, I, I mean, we're, we're kind of tied into that one. Um, so that's, that's the gist, I, I mean, that's a very quick overview of it. There's a, there's a whole lot more that can go into the requirements that we need. So we'll need to verify water permits, uh, if they have, say, like a mobile unit, like I mentioned, we have to make sure that the county has given proper waste management permits. So many times that's a compost type of permit. Um, and there, like I said, if anybody's interested, I mean, feel free to reach out to me and I can absolutely go over those requirements as well. Great. Thank you very much. So, um, and again, all of you, uh, all the speakers contribute to, you know, one of the uh, pieces of the puzzle, you know, to hopefully we can um, tackle this access deer situation. I want to thank all of you. This is, you know, Dr. Bell was the last speaker. Um, Dr. Bell, thank you very much for reaching out to me when you, when you saw my um, press release come out. Appreciated with all the information that you've shared. And I will share it with, um, you know, the people who have signed on who are interested in this. Um, just for your information, everyone, um, tonight was a uh, panel one. I wanted to bring over the, the um, important members of our government that could help us with this access deal problem. And I will be glad, gladly share with anybody and everybody who may be um, also interested. And, um, and um, oh, so my staff has logged the questions that were typed into the meeting and we will follow up to get answers. They're so awesome. Um, if there are other comments, please email me at my name, uh, Maui County email address, is, which is 
yukilei.sugimura at mauicounty.us. And uh, we will gladly you know, accumulate information. Um, I also wanted to um, share with you that um, next week, Monday, is my committee meeting for the council. And I'm going to be taking up the Kula Egg Park. And as part of that, for the Kula Egg Park, um, I'm gonna probably bringing in access deer and just information about what's happening at the Kula Ag Park and some of what you've shared tonight, just so that we can have a broader um, um, community discussion about this, because I think it's really important. I'm glad to hear that there's a possibility, thank you Phyllis, of uh, maybe getting some fencing for the Kula Ag Park, because um, that was a request that the farmers had for me last year and then, well, two years ago now, um, because then COVID hit. So. Um, there's challenges that we're facing because of COVID, but I think that because of COVID, the challenges are that we need to maybe go hunting and share the meat and help feed the people that may need it. So um, I, I just wanted to um, close by telling you um, that I really appreciate your time and because this is beyond your regular workday and I plan to have another panel with the landowner, um, Ken Miranda, um, from Kanaolo Ranch said that he's not available tonight, but he'll come at another time. And Dr. Kyle Kairos, he is the president of the Maui County Farm Bureau. Um, and um, someone from Kahikinui emailed me um, last night. And uh, I, I, I still have to talk to them, but they also wanted to be part of this, as well as um, you know some other um, community members that we'll put together. But I'm really looking for seeing if we can all work together to find some solutions. I know that money is always a, a big thing and um, I like to go out and search for money. So I hope that, you know, through the help of each of you and your agencies that maybe we can help the farmers and ranchers with some of their challenges that they may have because of the access deer and as well as swine and other uh, feral animals that um, destroy their crops. Um, and I'm not saying to completely eradicate, I'm just saying that we need to manage and control. So um, in closing, I wanna give a special shout out to Phyllis um, 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 Shimabukuro Geyser. And during last year, I had asked her if she could update, um, uh, this is a side issue, but the egg um, uh, mapping uh, were, was gonna be um, updated. And all the islands except Maui County uh, were gonna be included. And the problem was because of funding, but she with through her barrel tax, she found funding. So now Maui County is gonna be included in the update of the ag, um, of ag program. And I really appreciate that. I just wanted to give you a shout out because that was that's super important. But all of you, thank you very much. Um, I wanna thank my staff for you know being here and working extra to make this possible and I'll be in touch with each of you. And um, if you don't mind, we'll publish your contact information in case any of the people listening would like to get in touch with you. I, I really, really appreciate what you do and please reach out to me in my office if we can ever help you. So thank you everybody. Thank you for being here. There'll be more to come. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>